Remember, I love the Jesus, it is now. It is now. This morning's scripture comes from Luke chapter 16. Excuse me. Luke chapter 14. Where we're talking about the cost of being a disciple of Jesus. Hear these words. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, and he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Wow. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he, not, will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if it, he has enough money to complete it? Or if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose one coming against him with 20,000 men? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask them for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up anything he has will not be my disciple. Salt is good. But you know it loses its saltiness. And if it loses it, can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile because it is thrown out. He who hears and can hear these words, let him hear. This is the word of God for the people. God. Thanks be to God. So what do you suppose Jesus is saying to us today when he says that if we don't do this and we don't do that, we are not his disciples? Well, I personally believe that he's talking a little bit about strategic planning in our lives. Strategic planning. And that's the title of today's message. Let me start off by sharing a short story. Suppose you were on an outside flight to Asia, says a motivational speaker, and heard this announcement from the captain. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We're traveling west across the Pacific Ocean. In a few hours, you will be able to look down and see land. When that happens, we're going to start looking for a big city with an airport. If we find one, before our fuel runs out, we will land. Then we will figure out where we will go and what we will decide and where we want to go next. In the meantime, folks, just sit back and relax and enjoy the trip. Would you be able to relax after hearing that? I don't think I could. Wouldn't it be better if somebody had planned ahead? It has been said that the average American spends more time planning their vacation than they do planning their life. Wow. Can you imagine that? Hmm. Jesus certainly believed we should have a plan for our lives. In fact, on one occasion he told his disciples, and I quote, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose the king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men Opposed to one coming against him with 20,000. 
If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask them for terms of peace. Now Jesus is asking us to reflect on our lives and not simply react to our lives. Did you ever think about that? There's a tragic story that came out of Portland, Oregon back in 2004. Diane was a 56-year-old bus driver with many years of experience. She pulled into the Sunset Transit Center shortly before noon. She was running six minutes late and was eager to use the bathroom. After waiting impatiently for her passengers to disembark, Diane hurried off the bus, leaving the engine in gear and running. No parking brake engaged. She walked around in front of the bus and reached in the driver's door to pull the lever and close the door. Well, you see, this bus is equipped with automatic brakes that keep it from moving as long as the doors are open. Once the door shut, the brakes release. Why make plans 
And it's true, that life does have a, a way of knocking us off of our course. That's why part of our planning and preparation should take into consideration life crises, for surely they will come. A second reason many of us fail to plan is that we simply do not want to change. Oh, there's that nasty word again, change. That is, if we plan for such things as financial security, marital happiness, good health, and a meaningful legacy to our community, we might have to change some of our present habits. We do not like change, do we? We just abhor it. I heard about a fellow back in the days when radio was a dominant medium who bought a radio, turned it to WSM in Nashville, home of the Grand Ole Opry, and then pulled off the notch. He knew what he liked. As far as he was concerned, nothing was going to come along that he would like any better. So he pulled off the notch to the radio so that they could not be changed. The station could not be changed. If that's your attitude, you don't want to hear Jesus' words about sitting down before you build a tower or before you engage an enemy because planning for the future implies changes in how we live in the present. I trust that a few of us are that foolish, however. We would like to make our lives count for something, wouldn't we? We would like to fulfill our dreams and to believe that our best days lie ahead, wouldn't we? So where do we begin? Well, let's begin with the end in mind. That's what Stephen Covey encouraged us to do years back with his best-selling book, The Seven Habits of Highly Efficient People. When we get to the end of our life, will we do so with a lot of regrets? What will our friends say about us, our family? Will we have the resources to meet the challenges of our final years? Not only our financial resources, but emotional resources, relational resources, and spiritual resources. There's another little book titled Life Focus by Jerry Foster that introduces us to a concept that I hope you will take seriously today. He calls it life wealth. Life wealth refers to each of the important areas of our life. Our finances, our health, our relationships, and our spiritual life. These are our assets. All four are necessary to our well-being. How do you want your life to end, asked Jerry Foster. With your final breath, do you want to utter what a satisfying, fulfilling, and meaningful life I have lived? Do you desire your relationship with your spouse and your children to grow closer and stronger right to the very end? Do you want to leave a rich legacy of material and non-material treasures for your heirs? Do you hope that friends and co-workers who attend your memorial service are filled with gratitude for your contribution to their lives? If you answer in the positive to each of these questions, then you need a plan for bringing these to fruition. Foster suggests a very practical plan, which he calls the Vector Principle. Now, some of you know about vectors. For those of us who don't, a practical application of vectors will help us. Let's suppose we are in an airplane flying to Europe. But somehow, right at the beginning of our flight, we are knocked off course just a few degrees. As we keep flying, that little discrepancy in our direction is amplified over time and distance. So we don't arrive in Europe at all. We arrive somewhere in North Africa. You see, just a few degrees at a point of origin produces a large variation in our final destination. That, in essence, is the vector principle. 
small changes at one point in our life produce major life-affecting results later in life. Let's suppose that a person decides at the age of 35 to jog two miles every day. And she keeps this up day after day. And you see that this small change in this person's lifestyle might have major ramifications for her health 35 years later. A small change, but with major consequences. The same might be said of taking up walking two miles every day at age 60. Can you see that putting $100 every month in a mutual fund when you're 35 can produce significant income when you reach the retirement age? Small change. But the rewards can be significant. Some of us are far beyond 35, most of us. But it is never too late to begin sound financial habits. What might happen if you begin today finding a way daily to pay more attention to your spouse or your children or a friend? Might it not also strengthen your relationship in such a way that you will be able to count on each other's love and loyalty right until the end of life. <laughs> and then, <laughs> then there's our relationship with God. <laughs> what would it mean for your spiritual life if you began spending just a little bit more time, a little bit more time each day in God's presence, listening for God, guidance, and how you should lead your life and committing yourself daily, unconditionally, and walking in the way God would have you go. The vector principle. Small, doable changes at one point in your life, which produces major life affecting results later in your life. Somebody once noted that the mighty Mississippi begins with the bubbling of a little spring somewhere in Minnesota. We're told that vast areas of Holland have been covered by floods that began with a, with a break in dikes no larger than your hand. You don't have to have a blinding Damascus Road type experience to make your life more pleasing to God and more satisfying to yourself and to those you love. Sometimes all it takes is a small change in your daily routine. Robin and I have noticed that over the course of the last 20 years. Small changes, small daily intentional changes that made a big difference in our marriage, in our lifestyle, in our finances, in our health and in our relationship with God. Let me challenge you this day to begin making small deposits in your life wealth account. Take each of these four areas of your life, your finances, your health, your relationships, especially with your, your relationship with your spouse or your children, and your relationship with God. What is one small thing you can do to improve each of these areas of your life. Now this is not a frivolous thing. This could be the most important day of your life if you can make a few small changes that would change your final life destination. Just a few small degrees. Steve Reeves tells the story of a woman who underwent a very delicate form of brain surgery. In removing the tumor, the doctors were concerned that the slightest miscue could cause the loss of either her memory or her eyesight. So they asked the woman to choose which side of the brain, which side of the brain tissue they entered with their scalpels. In other words, if she had to lose one of these senses, which one would she prefer? Wisely, she said, let me think about it overnight, and I'll tell you tomorrow what sense is more important to me. Here's the 
here's what she did. The next day she told the doctors, if I had to lose either memory or sight, I would prefer to lose my memory. When asked how she arrived at her decision, she calmly replied, I'd rather see where I'm going than remember where I have been. I'd rather see where I'm going than remember where I've been. I want you to see where you're going and to make the changes required to get there. That's God's will for you and me. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete? Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20? Jesus was warning his followers to carefully consider the cost of discipleship. But his words also carry a very practical message today to live. Think about your life. Make those little changes.